The re-establishment of Iran's deterrence on October 1st stands as yet another critical move in a series of strategic plans by the Islamic Republic to counter the aggression of both the United States and Israel. This deterrence, however, is not a simple show of force or an invitation to war. Rather, it is a calculated measure aimed at maintaining stability in a highly volatile region. Iran's leadership, both political and military, has been clear. Any escalation into a regional war would be disastrous not only for the Middle East, but for global peace and stability. Iran's deterrence serves as a stark warning to Israel to resist any temptation of initiating conflict under the protection of the U.S. and Israel's sophisticated defense systems, such as the Iron Dome. The Iranian message is simple. While the U.S. may back Israel militarily, any attempt to engage Iran directly would set the entire region ablaze. This sentiment was echoed by a prominent Iranian intellectual, Professor Mohammad Marandi of Tehran University, who, in a recent interview, shed light on the motives behind Iran's deterrence. During the discussion, Marandi dismissed fears surrounding Israel's potential use of nuclear weapons, arguing that Iran has spent years preparing for such threats. According to him, Iran's countermeasures are not merely defensive, but have been carefully developed over the years, involving both military strategy and the refinement of its nuclear doctrine. The overarching goal, Mirandi emphasized, is not to provoke war, but to deter aggression and prevent further destabilization of the region. The professor highlighted that Israel's nuclear arsenal, while a major point of concern in the international community, is not something that paralyzes Iran with fear. Iran has long been aware of Israel's nuclear capabilities and has methodically built its own defensive and offensive strategies in response. What's most striking about Mirandi's comments is the assertion that Iran's nuclear doctrine is adaptive, meaning it could evolve in the face of existential threats, possibly signaling that Iran has the capability and willingness to defend itself in ways that go beyond what is publicly known. Content like this often gets overlooked by YouTube's algorithm, making it harder for important truths to reach the people who need to hear them. You have the power to change that. By liking, sharing with your loved ones, and spreading the word, you help ensure these critical perspectives don't go unheard. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and stay connected for the latest updates and deep analyses on Iran, Lebanon, Gaza, and beyond. Together, we can make sure the real story gets told. And right now, with this new air defense system from Israel, from the United States to Israel, they call it the THAAD air defense system, which is a kinetic air defense system, doesn't have a warhead, cannot be used offensively. We know all of that. It's not a new air defense system. I talk with many military professional, uh, many military analysts, they're thinking that is not a game changer when it comes to the conflict in the Middle East. But do you think at the same time the Biden administration is trying to do something to calm down the Israeli government, the Netanyahu administration, or they're sending a message to Iran that they're going to support Netanyahu for whatever he wants to do? I don't think they need to send a message to Iran to, 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 to point out that they are supporting Netanyahu no matter what he does. But uh, I do think uh, it is a concession to Netanyahu, like all the other concessions that they always give to him. Uh, I don't think it's going to make a big difference. Uh, the, you know, from the very beginning, when this, this uh, direct conflict between Iran and the Israeli regime began, I said to people that uh, in April, when, when Iran first carried out an attack, that that attack, I said it back then quite openly, that the attack was mostly an intelligence gathering operation. It was basically done with a lot of old drones and m mostly um, older missiles and a few newer missiles uh, in order to gather intelligence, to draw fire, which the Americans and the Israelis spent, I think, together about $4 billion 
but it was but more important than the than the the cost was for Iran to figure out what sort of capabilities they had because they really went all out. And then after the murder of uh, Ismail Haniye when in Tehran and his companion when they were martyred together, uh, I said again uh, that and I, the reason why I'm explaining this to you is because I I I, I want to. The, the final point that I want to make, I want people to remember what I said in the past. I said that Iran will retaliate and that it, the retaliation will be harsh and severe. And uh, gradually, there was growing skepticism. And I had a uh, the, the final discussion I had was with uh, Pierce Morgan, where he was saying that Iran is not going to do anything. And I told him that it's coming. And, it literally happened the day after. It's not because I had any inside information, but it's because I have an understanding of what goes on in Iran. And I think it's best for people in the West and elites to recognize that uh, nothing is going to stop an Iranian retaliation if the Israeli regime strikes. The Thad system is not going to stop it. In fact, uh, all it is going to do is it's going to show that not only have the Israelis failed to stop Iranian missiles, but it's going to show that the Americans will fail in stopping uh, Iranian missiles. And I think that's not going to be good for uh, the United States when it wants to sell weapons to the rest of the world, for it to be seen as incapable. Iran will hit, you know, regardless of what the Israeli regime does to Iran, what you know, whether they strike military targets, whether it's a uh, it goes beyond military targets, whether it's a mild attack or a very heavy attack, the Iranian response is going to be much, much harsher, much more harsh. It is not going to be the same as the Israeli attack. And so in the West, they can interpret it the, whatever in whatever way they like. They will always try to uh, to spin the situation to make it seem like Israel is strong which is fine, but at least they shouldn't make uh, their own analysis that they give to their own leaders uh, based upon the spin that they produce. Iran, uh, in their strike against Israel, caused serious damage to the regime. And if it wasn't so damaging, Netanyahu wouldn't be so adamant to strike back hard at Iran. If it was a, a failure, it, it, then there's no reason for the Israeli regime to, to be so outraged. They could just say that we took out 99% of the missiles or all the missiles fell into open fields and caused no damage. And so we don't feel the need to strike back at Iran. But they feel the need that they have to strike back hard because they were humiliated. Uh, but Iran still hasn't used its best missiles. It hasn't used its best technology. It is still uh, using older missiles and its older capabilities because it does not want the Israelis to know what it has. And it does not want the Israelis or the Americans to be able to work on how to defend uh, the Israeli regime against Iran's capabilities. So. In April, the Americans were foolish. The Israelis were foolish. They exposed, they revealed everything that they had. During the missile strike, they were unable to um, bring down those missiles. And today, they can talk about a THAAD system. They can talk about whatever they like. But the Iranians, if the Israeli regime strikes, Iran will hit back very hard. And then if the Israeli regime strikes again, Iran will do it again and again and again until Netanyahu is beaten into submission. And uh, we shall see. You recall as well as I that a year ago, uh, when the first hospital was bombed, uh, they killed 500 people, according to some estimates. And uh, there was global outrage. And then immediately, the Western media started claiming that a a rocket that had failed uh, hit the hospital. And even if a small rocket that the resistance was firing had struck the hospital, you would have had maybe a few people.
people killed if it just hit right in the middle of them. Not 500 people it wouldn't have wiped out. So the West, the Western media knew they were lying. But just like on October the 7th, where they lied about beheadings and about rape in order to justify the uh, the, the, the genocide in 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 Gaza, they tried to blame the victim uh, so that they could decrease the global rage so that the Israeli regime could continue with its genocide. What we saw a few days ago again was the same thing. A attack the hospital, people burned alive, we burned a lot, were burned alive. We saw it, we saw the footage. But for example, Sky News went and tweeted uh, about um, uh, an, an Iran and used the, this image uh, as if uh, this had nothing to do with Gaza. And uh, and also we saw how Sky News, for example, I mean the other media outlets are uh, are more or less the same, but Skype is uh, Sky News, I think, is uh, more crude these days in its propaganda. Sky News, when four of the Israeli so, uh, soldiers were killed on the northern border with Lebanon by Hezbollah drones, soldiers that were going to be used to attack Hezbollah, Sky News read their names. On and called them teenagers if, as if they're just high school students who are going to school or who are coming home from school. But they never read the names of the people who were burned alive in the uh, airstrike a few days ago, a days ago. They don't read out the names of the people who are dying in the different cities in Lebanon during the airstrikes that are taking place as we speak. So Western media is trying to manage the narrative because they are part of this war. They are part of this genocide. They are they are guilty just like the Israeli regime. But I I would I think that to a degree uh, the Israelis do want to distract attention away from Gaza, and so so we won't be focused too much on the ongoing uh, starvation siege that's taking place, uh, where four hundred thousand people are being starved to death by the Israelis, and the Americans are talking about maybe punishing them a month from now after everyone is dead, probably. That is part of it. But I also think that uh, this expansion of escalation and expansion is something that Netanyahu needs. He needs the war to continue uh, in order to remain in power. And if he does not expand the war and it just goes on and on without anything, without any achievements, then he could also lose his hold on power as well. So he needs to attack Lebanon. He needs to strike Iranian targets in order to expand the war and to bring in the Americans. Because without the Americans, he will lose. He will lose against Hezbollah. And I said this also, this is another thing that I said earlier. I'm not an oracle. I, you know, we, we just, what we try to do is we just try to look at things uh, without uh, being influenced by western spin and when we do that they think we call us they call us propagandists but the problem is that we are always right in our and in in the way we analyze and they get it wrong but they uh want to project what they do upon others when said hassan nasrullah was martyred when the senior commanders were martyred Western media was saying this was a huge achievement and Hezbollah will not be able to continue and how are they going to be able to resist? And I said repeatedly in Western media that Hezbollah will emerge even stronger. And I told I told people that this is not rhetoric. This is not just, you know, this is not empty. These are not empty words. Hezbollah, the, their notion that somehow Hezbollah will fall apart or Hamas or Islamic Jihad or any other organization is based upon their own orientalist worldview that somehow everything here is dependent on individuals whereas in the west they have structures and they have uh sophisticated uh you know, mechanisms and checks and balances here it's the same hezbollah is a sophisticated organization with very sophisticated and well-educated people highly trained people and they will continue to do their work. Just like in Iran, when Imam Khomeini passed away, 
uh, in the West, they were saying the revolution is over. But in a day, a new leader was chosen. And we see today Iran is far more powerful and influential than it was back then. The same is true as with Hezbollah. Uh, the, 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 the troops are highly motivated. The people, uh, their, 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 their morale is very high from what I saw in Lebanon. When I, the last, from until the very end, uh, I can say with confidence that their, the people who I spoke with, their confidence grew over, over, you know, every day that I, that I witnessed things, their confidence grew from, increased from, from the previous day. So, uh, Netanyahu became drunk, and so did the West, became drunk because of their successes uh, in Beirut and the assassinations and the murders. But uh, rational people don't get drunk. They don't make decisions, at least they don't make their key decisions when they're drunk. And right now, the Israeli regime, I think, is still drunk, and their Western allies are, are drunk as well. Even though what we've been claiming after the martyrdom of Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah, that Hezbollah will beat them on the battlefield, so far has turned out to be right. The Israelis are having a very terrible time on the border between Palestine and Lebanon. Mirandi also revealed that the recent deployment of the U.S.-built Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, THAAD system in Israel, designed to protect against long-range missile attacks, will not deter Iranian capabilities. He stressed that Iran's missile technology, already proven to be capable of penetrating Israeli defense systems, remains a formidable challenge for any protective shield, no matter how advanced. The deployment of THAAD, from Iran's perspective, does not alter the strategic balance or reduce the threat of retaliation. Iran's position, as articulated by Mirandi and many other officials, is not to stoke the flames of war, but to prevent them. Iran has made it clear that the status quo, one in which all sides respect each other's power, is preferable to the chaos that would ensue from military conflict. In a region already burdened by complex conflicts in Syria, Iraq, Lebanon and Yemen, the initiation of a war between Iran and Israel could quickly spiral out of control, drawing in regional and global powers. This deterrence policy is deeply rooted in Iran's historical and ideological stance against foreign intervention and its commitment to regional sovereignty. Iran sees itself as a defender of oppressed nations in the region, particularly the Palestinians, and as a counterweight to Israeli expansionism and U.S. influence. The message behind Iran's October 1st deterrence was clear. Any aggression towards Iran would be met with a response that could endanger not just Israel, but potentially the broader region. Yeah, when you look at the way that they went after Hezbollah by assassinations of Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah together with commanders. And right now they're trying to do, went on the ground in the southern part of Lebanon. And at the same time, they're trying to put a lot of pressure on the political parties in Lebanon to, to isolate Hezbollah politically. How do you find in that direction? Are they going to be successful? Are they going to achieve anything in Lebanon with the current phase? You, you've been in Lebanon recently. You know what's going on there. How do you find it in terms of the political pressure going to Hezbollah? Well, we, we have to keep in mind that that's what they've been saying in Yemen. They've been trying this, to do the same thing in Yemen. Has it, has it achieved results? No. Why? Because in Yemen today, Ansarullah, or the Houthis as they call them in the West, they're much more popular than ever before. Not just in Yemen, but across the world, across the region and across the world, even beyond the region. We, there is evidence of that. But Ansarullah inside Yemen is also more popular. No one, or very few people at least, want to be seen fighting Ansarullah as Ansarullah is fighting Israel. In Lebanon, the same is true. The Palestinians, they're not going to, the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, they're not going to take, 
move against Hezbollah because Hezbollah is fighting for them. The uh, the different co- the Sunni community in Lebanon has tilted dramatically towards Hezbollah, and they are overwhelmingly now seeing through the you know consp- what what the what NATO they now see very clearly what NATO did to Syria the schism that was created uh, a decade ago over Syria now that has been healed because a they see Hezbollah as defending Sunnis and the Palestinian cause which the Palestinians are overwhelmingly uh, almost all of them are Sunni there are some Christians maybe a handful of Shia but they're Sunni and uh, and also, they see that the same people who are supporting the dirty war in Syria are the ones who are killing the Palestinians today. Israel was supporting the, the Syrian uh, armed groups. NATO was supporting them, and so were countries in, in our region that are allied to the United States. And those countries that are that are not today helping kill Palestinians, they're quiet. They're doing nothing. The best of them is Turkey, which just talks doesn't do anything in practice. So Sunnis in Lebanon have now tilted towards uh, Hezbollah. The Christians, Iran, uh, Iran uh, may be uh, despised by the West, but in our region, Christians in Syria and Iraq and Lebanon and Palestine know that Iran, Hezbollah and, uh, uh, and, and their allies have always protected the Christians. So a, a large m- segment of the Christian population in Lebanon can, is officially, they are Hezbollah allies. They may have differences, some of them with Hezbollah, but the only group that is really seriously trying to uh, move towards some sort of civil war in Lebanon is uh, the Lebanese forces and, and those who are close to the Lebanese forces. They don't constitute a majority. No one is going to join them against, no major group is going to join them against Hezbollah at a time when Hezbollah is fighting against this genocidal Zionist regime. So basically anyone who joins Western embassies and uh, Samir Jaja and the Lebanese forces, they're going to be discredited in the eyes of the people of Lebanon, just as in Yemen, just as in Iraq or anywhere else in the region. No one wants to be seen, no sane person wants to be seen as siding with the Israeli regime. Because now across the world, the regime is despised. In our region, obviously, it, the hatred goes even further because people are watching the news live. They, they, they see the Palestinians and the Lebanese on, on Arabic television every day. So um, this is going to fail. And people like... Uh, Samir Jaja and the Lebanese forces. These are the same people who were who carried out massacres in the 1980s on behalf of the Israeli regime and with the Israeli regime, they slaughtered 4,000 Palestinians in the Sabra Shatila camp. No one is going to join them, and no one will expect them to be take a a po- people who carry out genocide in the past. No one is going to expect them to be with Hezbollah today, and no one is going to join them against Hezbollah. Because if they do, as I said, their credibility and reputation will be destroyed. So I don't think there's going to be any serious move. I mean, Western embassies are working on it. Their their people are working on it. They're working with the Lebanese forces and others to try to do something. But it's not going to work. And recently we had the foreign minister of Iran going to Saudi Arabia, talking with them. Do we know how the Iranian government, the Iranian, the Pazeshkan administration is trying to manage the situation considering the Arab states and the way that they can be used to attack Iran, Israeli attack on Iran? What do we know from that? Are they going to collaborate with Israel? Do they have any sort of response, rigid response to Iran that they're not going to be there supporting Israel? What do we know from these meetings again i think it's there it's very it's going to be very difficult for anyone to cooperate with the israeli regime because it only undermines their legitimacy in the eyes of the public the public across the region is already very unhappy with 
those governments that are not actively supporting the Palestinians and the Lebanese, whether it's Saudi Arabia or Jordan or the Emirates or Egypt or Turkey, it doesn't matter. Any government that's not supporting the cause is, is, is frowned upon. So if any of these governments actually helped the Americans or the Israelis, for that matter, in, in striking Iran, under these circumstances where genocide is being carried out and genocidal attacks are being carried out in Lebanon as well, alongside the genocide in Gaza, uh, it's only going to make their, their situation, the situation for these governments, more difficult to manage. And, you know, as we discussed, I think, before, uh, and, you know, often things seem quiet and calm, but uh, a small uh, spark could lead to a, a forest fire. We saw that when the young man in Tunisia burnt himself alive for local grievance. It had ramifications across the region. That's one issue. The second is that the Iranians have already warned these countries that if their airspace is used or if their uh, territory is used in any way or form against Iran, they will be seen as hostile. And these countries, all of them are extremely vulnerable. None of them are strong countries. All of them are very vulnerable. If Iran just, let's say, fired a few missiles at the Emirates, the country would probably collapse. The backdrop to these tensions is, of course, the ongoing conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, particularly in Gaza. Iran has long positioned itself as a key supporter of the Palestinian cause, providing material and political support to groups like Hamas and Hezbollah. This support, viewed by Israel as a direct threat, complicates any attempt at de-escalation. For Iran, however, this is about maintaining a balance of power in the region, ensuring that no single actor, particularly Israel, can dominate through sheer military might. Iran's deterrent strategy is also a signal to the United States, whose military presence in the region has been viewed by Tehran as a destabilizing force. The U.S.'s continued support for Israel whether through diplomatic backing or military aid, complicates the regional dynamics. Iran has repeatedly expressed its opposition to U.S. military bases in neighboring countries, viewing them as launch points for potential aggression against its territory. What Mirandi and others are stressing is that Iran is not interested in direct confrontation unless provoked. The deterrence is Iran's way of saying it is prepared for any eventuality, but prefers peace. This dual approach deterrence paired with calls for de-escalation shows that Iran is acutely aware of the risks involved in a regional conflict and is determined to avoid them unless it has no other choice. What remains uncertain is how Israel will respond in the coming weeks and months. With Benjamin Netanyahu at the helm, Israel's leadership has been historically hawkish, particularly when it comes to Iran. The Netanyahu government has repeatedly sounded the alarm over Iran's nuclear program, calling it an existential threat to Israel. However, Mirandi suggested that Israel might soon come to realize that Iran's call for de-escalation is not a sign of weakness, but a recognition that further conflict would benefit no one. The stakes in the region are incredibly high, and the situation remains fragile. Both sides are armed to the teeth, and even a minor incident could spiral into a full-scale war. Yet Iran's re-establishment of deterrence on October 1st is a clear message that it is prepared for such an eventuality. The ball, however, is in Israel's court. Whether Netanyahu and his government heed Iran's warnings or push the region closer to war remains to be seen. For now, the focus is on maintaining the delicate balance that keeps the peace, however uneasy it may be. Iran's deterrence is designed to remind Israel and the world that while war is not Iran's desire, it is more than ready to defend itself if necessary. As tensions simmer, the international community can only hope that cooler heads will prevail.